So the the bronze lava for me, the, the bronze basin, is maybe the place where we as believers in Yahuwah, where maybe we spend most of our time, isn't it? Where's that verse? I think it's 2 Corinthians. I'm going to show it to you and maybe you'll see the connection. Um, it's either 1 Corinthians 3 or 2 Corinthians 3. Yes, 2 Corinthians 3. Look at this. Um, if we all with an open face, what is an open face? How do we get an open face? You only get an open face if the veil is removed, right? Because there was a veil. Where's that verse now? Um, even upon this day, 2 Corinthians 3.15, when Moses is read, there's a veil upon the hearts of the people. So when you've got a veil upon your heart or over your eyes, when the Torah, when Moses, when anything of the first five books is read, when there's a veil over you, you don't see what God is saying to you. When there's a veil over you, then um, you don't understand what is uh, being read to you. You don't understand Moses. Moses is just a, a representation of the first five books. Moses is not God. We, we are not following Moses. We are following Yahuwah. But Yahuwah says, when Moses is read, when what I gave Moses is being read, there's a veil upon your hearts. But only when we turn, what is turn? Turn is teshuva. When you repent, when you turn back, you're on the wrong way. Now you turn back on the right way. You turn back to God and now the veil is being taken away. You see that? Where do you repent? Where do you turn back to God? At the altar where you repent of your sin and the blood of Messiah, Yeshua is sacrificed in our place and, and in our place he carries the death penalty. So at the first place of the tabernacle, we turn to God and there the veil is taken away. We see the sacrifice. We see the altar. And, and it's almost like, you know, the next verse says, um, the veil is taken away by the Spirit because the Ruach of God gives us freedom now because we were in Egypt in bondage. We get freedom. We bring our sacrifice at the altar. We move on to the bronze laver. Now the veil is taken away. Now we can honestly look into the water. We can see our own reflection. Now 2 Corinthians 13 says, Now we can, with an open face, without a veil, we can behold as in a glass. In those days, there wasn't mirrors. You know, so people could see themselves in a glass, but you could also see yourself in the reflection of water. And that for me is the beauty of the bronze um, labor, of the bronze basin. As the priest came from his repentance, looking into the bronze basin, he will see a reflection of himself. When you look at your reflection and you see your sinful self, your old self, you see all the bad things that you maybe still cling to. You see all the unrepented sin that you haven't dealt with at the altar. You see all the problems that you still have that isn't burned up at the altar. Then you look at yourself in the water, the veil is taken away, and you can honestly say, I'm not ready. I'm not even going to make this water filthy. I need to go back to the altar. I still have work to do. I still have repentance to do at the altar. You do this journey. Look at this verse. This verse for me is unbelievable. We, with an open face, behold as in the water or as in a glass. We behold the glory of Yahuwah. Wait now, stop here. When we look into the water, are we beholding Yeshua or are we seeing ourselves? You know, and, and none of us are there. 
I'm, I please, guys, I'm not saying I'm there. When I look into the water, whew, I, I see nothing of Yeshua, nothing. Corinthians is trying to teach us that we need to spend so much time at the altar and at the wash basin so that we will end up, when we look into the wash basin, into the water, we will see the glory of Yahuwah. We all, with an open face, spending enough time at the altar, behold or look into uh, as into a glass the glory of Yahuwah. We, we, we need to see Yeshua when we look into the bronze altar, uh, into the bronze basin. In, when we look into the living water, we must die to ourselves. We must be dead and burnt up on the altar. We mustn't live anymore. Yeshua must live in us. So when we still still see ourselves, we must go back to the altar. Because this verse says, every time we do this, you know, every time you've got this journey, between the altar, the wash basin, the altar, the wash basin, up and down, up and down. Here we go, over and over again. Nothing wrong with that. It's better than being arrogant and saying, I've repented all my sin. I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. I can now just, um, what does the Bible say? Boldly go to the throne of God. You know, for me, that's arrogant. You need to make a 100% sure. Because this, ver this verse says beautifully, we are changed into the same image. Can you see that? We are in a bad image. I'm in the image of Adam. The Bible says Adam was made in the image of God. But Seth, after Adam fell, after he sinned, Seth was made in the image of Adam. I'm in the image of Adam, sinful Adam. I'm not in the image of God. That's not what the Bible says. So when I look into this water at the wash basin, I see my sinful nature, my sinful image. But the more I spend time going back to when Moses is read, even to this day when Moses is read and we turn back to God, the veil is taken away. So daily we spend time in Moses and all the prophets and the gospels and the disciples. We spend time looking into the mirror of the Bible. We look into the word. The word tells us, go back to the altar. You've still got work to do there. If we are obedient, we go back to the altar. We do the work. We come back to the word of God. We look into the word of God up to the point where God says, you have been changed enough now. Look at this verse. We all with an open face beholding us in a glass, the glory of you who are not seeing ourselves. We are Look at that, changed into the same image from glory to glory. That is not something that happens instantaneously. It doesn't happen immediately. Every time you spend time at the altar, you get dirty. You get, um, you smell like smoke. You are full of blood. You know, tears are running down your face, but the the root or the the ash from the sacrifices, you know, are also flying all over you. So you can see the lines of tears on your dirty little face. The more you spend time at the altar, you go to the bronze laver, you look in there, you are changed. Every time you walk this journey, you are changed. Do you see that? Look at how beautiful 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 explains to us this journey between the altar and the bronze basin. I'm reminded of a story that somebody told. Um, there was a grandfather who lived on a hill somewhere, right? And there was a well or a, a fountain at the bottom of the hill. 
So the grandfather's son um, um, had to go down the, the hill to, to fetch the water and then carry it all the way up the hill. Um, and he could never understand because his his grandfather, um, when he was when this son wasn't um, you know following God yet, um, this grandfather would give um, this grandfather would give a bag like a um, a Hessian, you know these Hessian bags with which you put in your charcoal. He would give that dirty charcoal bag to the son to go and fetch the water at the bottom of the hill, right? So as the son would fill this bag with water, it was full of water, but as he was walking up the hill, half the water would run out of the bag because it's a Hessian bag. It's not a plastic bag. So the water isn't contained in the bag. By the time the son gets to the top of the hill to the house, you know, more than half the water has been spilled and there isn't enough. And the grandfather would send him all the way back again. And he would have to make this journey up and down, up and down a couple of times. And eventually he got fed up and he said, Grandfather, I'm I'm sick of this now. Why don't you just give me a plastic bag, you know, so that I can walk once and I can get all the water you need? Why do you give me this dirty, hessian bag? to take down, fill with water, half the water is wasted along the way. You know what, what the grandfather did? He said, what dirty Hessian bag. And the boy looked at that dirty Hessian bag in which the charcoal was. The bag was black with charcoal. But as he was walking up and down, the water washed that dirty bag. And as he was walking up and down, the water that spilled um, on this route next to the road, the flowers started growing next to this road. So the grandfather said, your journey cleansed the bag and brought flowers next to the road. Although you don't have a lot of water to show for it, you've got a lot to show. You've been washed clean, although you, while you're busy doing it, you don't see the results. But look at this bag, it's clean. Look at that little path that you've been following. It's full of flowers. So this journey between the altar and the bronze basin changes us. Look at this. We are changed. This work is done by the spirit of Yahuwah. We are not changed instantaneously. It is a journey. Um, the people had to, every time that they sent, they had to come on. They had to come to the tabernacle. They had to come to the altar. They had to spend time at the altar. The priest had to wash himself in the basin. The priest eventually had to bring the sacrifice or the um, the blood. The high priest had to bring the blood right all the way into the most holy place. So it's a continuous journey, this beautiful um, journey that we follow. All right, so the bronze basin, um, any comments on that before we continue to the anointing oil and the incense in Exodus 30? I think just that alone was worth listening to today, Marta, as far as the Torah portion is concerned. Mm -hmm. That was really powerful. Thanks for that. You see, that's the problem I I have with the Torah portion. Um, I was asked <clears throat> about twelve years ago to do a daily bi um, a Bible study on the Torah portion. So what I did, I started with the Torah portion. So where the Torah portion starts is Genesis one verse one, right? So the the Torah portion is then two or three chapters. Um, together with a couple of prophets, together with a couple of verses in the New Testament. And all of that had to be done in one week, right? So I started with the Torah portion, and it took me two weeks just to get through Genesis 1 verse 1 and all the way up to Genesis 1 verse 4. If you look at the Genesis Bible studies on the Two Trees YouTube page, it took me two weeks just to get through those few verses. 
So I very quickly told the group, I'm sorry, I'm not the right person to try and do the Torah portions because it's a rush. There's so much to read in a Torah portion that you just want to read through everything that you don't really break up or break open the treasures that's found in every word. So, um, you know what, it's almost 12 years now that I've been doing these Bible studies. And where are we now with the daily Bible studies? We are only at Samuel. You know, we've we've done Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and Samuel. It's nine books in 12 years, verse by verse. I'm not the right wow. person to do the Torah portions and break open everything because a week is basically not enough. <laughs> that That is the thing because we are only now in the beginning of this Torah portion. There's still so much to read. But, yeah, let's, let's see how far we can get. Thank you, Davey, for that. Anybody else? Mara, I have the same problem, and I think it's because you've been my teacher. Um <laughs> But with that being said, um, I also realized, you know, it's so difficult to do the Torah portion because there is just so much and you don't get the time. You don't really get the time to chew on it. But with that being said, to this year, I've really made a point because it's really my heart's desire to read the whole Bible for myself because I haven't done that yet. So um, I've joined a group online where they take two or three chapters per day. And I think... Um, the mythology around the madness is really for me just to read it and not to analyze it, even though I just want to sit and chew it. So I think maybe we need to, um, you know, follow the same advice for, for the Torah portion, because I think we will never have enough time. We can sit on this Torah portion for the rest of the year, um, just yeah. analyzing and breaking it up. There's just too much. Um so, yeah, I think sometimes uh, for people like you and me, we we have to uh, maybe just read. <laughs> and, yeah, I think we will get to a point where something will be really interesting, where we can spend that time and, um, you know, just work through it. And I think today was a perfect example of, you know, trying to stick to it. Eventually, we will we will find something. And I think everybody will... Not everybody knows everything, so somebody will have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, my accentuate. Right. 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 Yeah, I have to accentuate. I have to confirm the fact that it is very good for especially new people um, on this road to try to do the Torah portions. Um, reading through the Torah portion in, uh, in the whole year, um, there's a couple of benefits. Like we've got half an hour left, so let's maybe talk about that. Uh, we're not going to get through the rest of the Torah portion today. All right. The Torah portion, like Martha said, will actually take you through the entire Bible in one year. And, and as, as they've put a, a, a Torah portion means it's a piece of the Bible out of the first five books. Together with that, in the same week, you then read um, uh, uh, something out of the prophets of the Old Testament. And it's always amazing how beautifully these things interconnect, right? And then there's always a, a part in the New Testament that you read as well that connects with, with the Torah portion, the prophets, and then the New Testament. As you as you read through all this, it is absolutely beautiful how you then manage to read through the Bible, but you are not reading from the beginning all the way straight through to the end. You are reading a, 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 a bit in the beginning, you are reading a bit in the middle, and you are reading a bit in the end. And you are doing that every week. And, and as you do that, you are going through the whole Torah, you're going through the whole um, Old Testament, and you're going through the whole New Testament. Um, a lot will come out of that, I promise you, even without people showing you stuff and breaking open stuff. I can promise you, as you spend time reading through that whole portion in your week, in your own daily Bible study, um, quiet times you have, you will learn so much already. 
And then at the end of that week, on the Sabbath day, after you've now had six days to work through the Torah portion, we then come to the seventh day, to the Sabbath. Then we can, you know, discuss the beautiful things out of that. Most of the times um, when we had Sabbath at our house, still when we were in the city, some of our meetings would be five, six hours long. You know, Daphne, she was still in England. Um, sometimes I would go and visit her family in Krugersdorp or Reinkisfontein somewhere, and she would be online from England. And we would sit there talking for four hours. You know, you, you, you can never talk about everything in these Torah portions. Now, the other amazing thing is, as you go through this cycle, because the Torah portion is about a cycle, just as the year is a cycle, and the year is divided into the seven feasts. It's amazing. When you read the Torah portions and you get to the dates of the feast, how your portion that you're reading is actually so relevant to that specific feast in that same period. So that's also quite um, a miracle, I think. Thirdly, Every year, you go through the Torah portion cycle, you learn new things. If you think you're going to go through the Torah portion, if you think you're going to go through the whole Bible, and you're going to see everything there is to see in your first cycle, you're mistaken. I promise you, there are people that have gone through the Torah portion for over 30 years. I know somebody who's done the Torah portion for 30 years years and that person said he still finds amazing things every single time he goes through the Torah portion that is how deep and amazing the Bible is so um, I'm going to open the mic to you guys I would have loved to get to the anointing oil I would have loved to get to the incense I'm so sad that we didn't have time for that because isn't that amazing? But you guys can maybe after we have um, switched off today, you guys can spend time reading through the rest of the portion. Um, I will actually now um, post all the readings for this week that was passed as well as the readings for the week that is lying ahead so that you guys can, can spend your time in that. All right, I'm opening the mic to you guys. Let's talk a little bit um, before we say goodbye at one o'clock. Mara, um, I would like to share something that I learned. Sorry, there's a lot of background noise at the moment. Yeah, I'm sitting outside. Um, but then let, um, your let, yeah. um, let us see you. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so yes, what I've learned... Um, in Genesis 8, I read that uh, in verse 22. I read that verse and then uh, then I learned something new. <laughs> um, yeah. The verse says, while, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Then I realized, there's not, we don't have four seasons as we are being taught of summer, winter, autumn, and spring, the Bible says we have summer and winter. And in Psalm 74, verse 17, it says, um, let me just get that verse. It says, Psalm 74. 74, verse 17. Yeah. It says, you have fixed the boundaries of the earth you have formed the summer and winter. <laughs> that was very interesting to me. I mean, I've, I've already read that verse a few times, and then it just hit me oh, the deception once again. And when I, I went on to the Strong's Concordance to look for the word autumn, it was nowhere to be found. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I wanted to see. Pam, um, I want to confirm that. Um, I never thought about that before. Last week, I actually um, listened when somebody said, there isn't four seasons in the Bible. Um, and then I thought, what are you talking about? We've got spring, you know, we've got the spring feasts. 
Don't yeah, we? We, yeah. we? But the thing is, we call them the spring feast. When it's spring in the northern hemisphere, there by Israel, we've got Pesach. Pesach is called the spring feast. But but spring is basically the beginning of summer. So the beginning of summer, and then you've got summer when it's very hot, and then summer dies again, and then winter starts. And I realized this guy was right. You know, he wasn't just crazy. The Bible doesn't talk about spring or autumn. It just talks about no. summer and winter. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, very interesting to me. <laughs> It is. Yeah. It's something I learned last week, and now you are confirming it. So it's like um, the second yeah. witness. Yeah, and also um, when um, the, the verse, uh, because it also says here, there's seed time and harvest time, and then yes. there's cold and heat. And then I thought, um, it's like God says, there's another verse that says, we must be... Um, Hot or cold, we cannot be lukewarm. In between, uh, uh, oh, it may be, wow. Yeah, in between. So there's not, you know, this. It's either summer or winter. It's not really um, a, a, another name. Like um, they can't then be really spring or autumn because autumn, the, well, the leaf starts to fall, but it's actually the beginning of winter. That that's that's yes. how I understand it because it's getting yeah. cold. It's not, it's not, yeah, that was just very interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, we, we are bad. not, <laughs> you know, we, we, we're not going to say, oh, you know, it's a sin to say there's spring and there's autumn. We, we're not going to make a, no. a doctrine out of it. <laughs> but isn't it amazing? You know, I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've seen this when this guy um, talked about it. I went into the <laughs> scriptures and I saw, my heavens, you know, there's, and, and now you said you're either hot or cold. Summer is hot, yeah. winter is cold, but spring yes, is a mixture of the two. So, so the, yeah. the Bible doesn't talk about spring. God doesn't want us to be mixed. You know, yes, summer. Okay, summer is ending. Yes, winter. Okay, winter is ending. Again, we we're not going to say it's wrong. We're not going to criticize you if you say autumn or something. We, it, it's not a, a yeah. salvation issue. But again, the Bible doesn't talk about spring or autumn. Thank you, Pam. You you yeah. you my second witness. Um, last week I got my first witness. <laughs> you are now the second witness. <laughs> Mara, I just quickly want to say something about the anointing oil, and I don't know if if you uh, if anybody knows that, but if you actually um, do a little study on the oils, do you realize that all the oils are antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral? So it's very interesting, and I can just imagine how good it would have smelled because it's um, you have a little bit of the citrus from the uh, what did the color miss? And then the rest is like a earthy, a wood uh, type of smell. So it, it must have smelled divine. I am, though, oh. very shocked at how Christians are just uh, replicating this oil, even though Yahuwah has warned yes. us three times. Three times yes. in that passage not to do it. Yeah. Um, so, Magda, you say two things. Number one, how amazing was this oil? And while we're talking about this oil, isn't it amazing how now in these modern days, with all the pharmakia we have and all the technology and all the doctors and all the hospitals, how many people, there are thousands of websites and people on Facebook and everywhere that are now turning back to healing with oil, essential oils, making essential oils and making natural herbal remedies. Myself, we, we live here in Dahlstrom. We are very, I mean, yeah, just here on my, next to my bed, I've got this oil somebody mixed for me. I forgot what it is. I must put it on. I totally forgot what it is. This is pure, this is pure frankincense um, essential oil. This oil also, I forgot what it is. I've got, I've got hundreds of bottles of oil. You know, so so everybody is returning back to to nature, and and look at this now, Exodus thirty verse twenty three, you will um you uh, take the, you also unto you the principal spices and pure myrrh, um five hundred shekels and sweet cinnamon 
250 shekels and sweet kalamus and cassia and olive oil and you'll make this holy oil. Yeah. Number one, all these, the frankincense, the myrrh, I'm drinking frankincense and myrrh on a daily basis, me and my whole family, for health. Um, a lot of people who don't believe in COVID, you know, they also um, drank frankincense and myrrh and they never got no sickness, no illness. We also like to drink it now just for, for normal flu, um, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, like you said. It's amazing how these things, we've read them all our lives, not understanding that they've got deep spiritual meaning, but they also have deep physical meaning. There's so much healing um, and calming, calming effects of these essential oils that people are using. Even if you look at Johnson's and Johnson's, they're making all their baby products with chamomile um, essential oils, you know, <laughs> because that calms the baby down. So it's amazing how we are uh, returning to these things. And nothing God ever put in his Torah isn't without a scientific or a biological or a spiritual reason. And I almost want to say, it always has a scientific, biological, and spiritual reason. With two trees, I've taught you guys, I've taught you guys, everything is always spiritual and physical. You can't only say, oh, the life of David was physical. It was only about David. Everything in David's life is about the Messiah. But everything in David's life is about us as well. Everything about the oil. And now the arrogance, you know, the, um, let me just share the screen again. Because, Martha, you, you touched on this. It's very important. Um, you make this essential oil in Exodus 30, and you'll sanctify the oil. Um, verse 33, whoever makes this oil or anything like it, whoever gives it to a stranger, this person will be cut off from his people. So we can make, well, the priests had to make this perfume and had to make these oils, but they were never allowed to give it out to strangers because why? It's holy. It is holy, set apart, um, separated for the use to God. I, I actually just want to share one thing, one note. Um, just like the oil is holy to God and must only be brought, same as the incense, it must only be brought before Yahuwah because it is for him and for him only. Here it is. Verse, I'm quickly going to read all of this to you because I want to just share this with you. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Take unto you the spices, stakta and onicha and kalbanum and pure frankincense uh, by their weight. And you'll make a perfume. This is verse 34 of Exodus 30. You'll make a perfume, a confection, confectionery, ne? after the art of apothecary. Apothecary is an art. And there were certain priests that had this art, you know, this beautiful mixture, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you mix it until it is perfect and it smells amazing and it says it will be tempered together what is i hope you guys did my my study on what is salt the salt covenant who of you did that study this week on the tempering of the perfume who of you did that this you were the first i've one only done the first part <laughs> okay do the rest because um, the Bible says the perfume is tempered as salt. It is tempered like salt. The tempering process is a difficult process. You know, how do you temper something? It's a procedure that is done by a certain high temperature. So, so when an element like gold or um, a food like chocolate, or in this case, these perfumes, when they are mixed together, they are mixed at a specific high temperature. You cannot go above that temperature because then you spoil. 
You can spoil the chocolate, you can spoil the gold, you can spoil the perfume. It must be made by that specific high temperature, but not a degree higher and not a degree lower. It must be, it must be tempered at that temperature. And then during the process, there's cooling down and there's rising in heat again, cooling down, blah, blah, blah. It is a, it's an art. It's a science to make this temperature. Just like that. Oh, look at, guys, look at how beautiful this goes with our journey between the altar and the basin. At the altar, there's high temperature. At the wash basin, the water cools us down again. We are tempered just like this perfume. We are going through this tempering process. Because why? Revelation 8 verse 4, guys. There's not enough time. I'm not going to look for these verses. You can make a note. Revelation 8 verse 4 says, The incense from the incense altar are our prayers, our service, our work as priests before Yahuwah is the incense that is burnt up before God so he can smell it. You cannot be that perfume or that incense if you don't go through this tempering process. Look at it further. And it's an art. Who's the artist? It's an art of apothecary. Who's the scientist or the artist that is mixing us uh, through this tempering process like perfume? Who's that artist? Is it the Ruach? The Ruach. Mm. Yes, is God it? himself. Yes. Mm. Through, God himself through his Ruach, like we behold as in a glass when Moses is read the word. Yeshua, this God, he's the one who's sitting and he's, you know, he's taking a drop of this. Can you see it? He's taking a drop of this and he's taking a, a little drop of this and he's, he's bringing the heat up and this oil is mixing together and he's adding the myrrh. What is myrrh? Myrrh is an, is an anti, what did Amachta say? Anti, antibacterial medicine sometimes it burns it's not tasty it's got a it's got a strange smell but but in the art of apothecary when you mix when you make essential oil of myrrh frankincense cinnamon you know all these um, natural elements and you make it at a specific temperature then they blend so beautifully together right he's that artist Listen to verse 36. And you will beat some of it um, together. You will beat it very small. You'll beat it. You'll beat and drown it. You know, a piece of frankincense and myrrh is hard. It's like a hard piece of rock. So it has to be beaten. Even when, when you make essential oils and you take... Um, Beautiful spices and um, uh, seeds and stuff. You have to beat the hell out of it to, to ground it down so that it's fine powder. So you can mix it with the oil so that you can temper it together. So you beat it together um, until it is very small and you'll put it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation. And whoever makes this for another pagan god or whoever gives this to a pagan or to a Gentile or to a stranger, somebody who doesn't understand this covenant, he'll be cut off from his people. Why? Because these beaten and tempered pieces of humans that are made into a beautiful Incense and perfume that is to be burned up on the altar in our service to our holy God. We are meant for him alone. Our tempering, 
our persecution, our difficult things we're going through when we feel we are beaten, is not for us to brag about. The perfume doesn't walk through the camp. Look at me, I've been beaten. I'm for God. I'm going to be used in the most holy place. I'm going to be put upon the incense altar. God is going to smell me. Oh, smell me. I smell so good. But to smell this good, I had to be beaten. I had to be tempered. I had to go through very high temperatures. Ooh, you don't know what I had to go through to be the perfume for the incense altar. No. Nobody knows the secret of how this perfume is put together. You know, only the artist in apothecary knows this. So we don't walk around bragging about the process that God puts us through so that we can serve him in the most holy place. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to uh, tell everybody, uh, Dahana asked about the group that I'm, I'm currently joining with regards to reading the Bible. So it's um, Front Porch Seeking Scripture Ministry. They're actually on Facebook. So what happens every year in around December, what they will do is they will actually um, uh, invite people to the, to the Facebook group. And this is just a place where you can have a discussion. But it's not necessary to be on the group itself. You can actually just go to the website and then you can just follow along. So All right, give, and, give yeah, the you website. You can cycle every year if you want to. Give uh, the website Mara, address, just have a look at the link. Uh, just give oh, me one sorry. second. It's in, the, mm -hmm. it's in the chat. It's, I think it will be almost a little bit easier if you seeking scripture.com. All right. Let me just share the screen. I'll show this to you guys. All right. There it is. Seeking scripture. Um, I'll also, uh, Magda, you can also put it onto the group. I, I haven't blocked the group yet. <laughs> so you can also put it there. Um, so, yeah. All then right. you guys, I, I, I really want to encourage you. That was the word I'm looking for. I want to encourage you to try to do the Torah um, portions. It is really good. You can still come to us um, to do to, to this Bible study every Sabbath, and you can discuss with us what you've learned, things you want to share. I can try to show you things I've learned. Um, but, yeah, it's a great idea to do the Torah portions. I, I'm not doing them right now because I've got so many other teachings that I am doing, that I am busy with. Maybe maybe I will do them next year. Maybe I'll finish with everything I'm, I don't know, doing this year. Maybe I will um, do a Torah portion cycle next year with, with everybody online going through the Torah portion verse by verse. I don't know. We'll see. Thank you, Magda. Hi. Would the you pleasure. Like to what you use to do your Torah portion? Because I don't have something. Okay, Dohana. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to put that link. Magda is going to put that link onto the uh, WhatsApp group. Yeah, then you follow from there. Now, the Torah portion cycle, it's a journey through the Bible. It is, um, I loved it. I did it for three years consecutively. You can do it until Yeshua comes back. You'll, you'll never learn everything. There's so much. Right, anybody else? You guys are very quiet today. Wow. If there's nothing, then um, I, I still have da Dahana as the last person who spoke. So maybe we'll ask Dahana to end for us in prayer. And then um, I'll greet you guys and say Shabbat Shalom. And we'll all see each other again next week, same time, same place. Thank you, um, Father who art in heaven. We thank you for this wonderful new day. Um, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for blessing uh, Mother with the knowledges and with the time to share with us um, the word. And we thank you for giving us the yearning and the craving to spend time here, um, to um, remain on the narrow but the right path. We ask that not only when we are here, we are focused on you, but on our daily lives, we remain focused on your word. And every word that we speak um, may be to bring um, awareness of your love and of repentance so that we may all 
um, unite one day in the kingdom. We pray you in the name of um, the Messiah and have a blessed day. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Dahana. Thank you, guys, all of you. May you have a wonderful week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Mada. Shabbat Shalom, Francis. Hi, Mada. Everybody in Uganda. Shabbat Shalom. You can say hi to them. They are all here. Oh, good day to all of you guys in Uganda. The rest of the people in South Africa, don't you all want to un unmute yourself, everybody, so we can all greet each other? So all the people in South Hello, Africa say hi to the people over there in Uganda. Shabbat Shalom. Hello. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Hello to everybody there. I like your little hat that Hello. you're sitting in. Is that your church today? Come again. Um, that little hat that you are sitting in, is that your church today? Yeah, yeah. this is what we have started. Yeshua has yes. helped us. Yeah. Guys, look at look at their church, ne? It's a it's a it's a hat made of um mud. The, the walls are made of mud and the roof is made of grass. Look at that. What a beautiful That's church, right. Nick. <laughs> well done, you guys. What? All right. Shabbat shalom to everyone. Oh, thank you so much. Shabbat yeah, shalom. We'll see you all again thank next you. week. See you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Keep well. Bye. 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 Bye.